This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. We're grateful to the Lord for who He is and all that He means to us, and I encourage you that the more that you see problems in our world, in our society, the more that you need to ask God, Lord, help me to be an answer. God has called us to be answers. Don't just look at problems and then be like everybody else and say, oh Lord, what is the world coming to? Be an answer. Ask God, Lord, make me an answer to a problem, a challenge that is in the world. Every time that you reach a young person, you're becoming an answer and maybe preventing a problem. The best war is the one that is avoided. The best tragedy, the best tragedy is the one that is avoided. The best massacre is the one that is avoided. Now listen, we're doing a youth conference not because we don't have anything else to do. Our young folks are in trouble. Our old folks are in trouble. But listen, if you're going to correct something in a society, start with the young. You know, old folks are stubborn. <laughs> it is what it is. They've been thinking that way a long time. And so if you're going to change a culture, start with the young folks. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Isn't it amazing that an 18-year-old, he didn't go to a high school, he didn't go to a college, he went to an elementary school and got children. 18 years old. The guy in Buffalo, 18 years old. Our world has experienced some terrible darkness. And let me just tell you this. You, you, you're talking, we just asked God in a song, speak to my heart, Lord. Thank God that there's a prophet in the house. Thank God that there is a word from God. Concerning everything that happens in our world. Everything that happens in the world. Now, the prophet doesn't need a note. All he needs is a word. Are you listening? And may I just tell you prophetically from Jesus Christ. We're in a dark world now. But even in the midst of a dark world in the same way where David was. The Holy Ghost spoke to me. Psalm chapter 27. The Lord is my light. David wrote that when he was in darkness. When he was running for his life. His world was caving in on him. Everything was dark around him. He was wondering, my God, what on earth are we going to do? He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He began to speak that God is my stronghold. When I'm afraid that something is going to happen to me or happen to my children or happen to my mama or my daddy. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He says, when my enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fail. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. David had a lot of doubts in his mind, but he said, I'm confident in this. Listen, let me just tell you this. That every time that you begin to experience uncertainty in your world, go to the things that you're certain about. Amen. There are certainties in the word of God that we do not vacillate and oscillate. We are certain about it. I don't know about you, but I'm certain that the Lord is my light. That he's my savior. That he's my healer. That he's my deliverer. I am certain about it. That he came and died. That he is love. I'm certain about that. I am certain about the fact that C.S. Lewis said that forgiveness is mandatory, but reconciliation is optional. God will command you to forgive people that he won't necessarily put you back with. Are you listening? And I just want you to know that we're called to be a loving people. When you have a love of Jesus Christ, you can't live with bitterness and hate and unforgiveness in your heart. You're paving a way to hell if you do. If you won't forgive others, God won't forgive you. I'm just, I'm just telling you the word. It's in the book. I didn't write it. I'm just delivering the mail. Are you listening? And I'm just here to tell you that we've got people that are in trouble. And I don't know about you, but the safest place to ever be is in the will of God. 
And that's why I know that whenever I have a word from God and I'm going into a dangerous territory, I don't worry about that. I'm safer in a war zone under the auspices of the Holy Ghost with a mandate from God that I am laying in my bed. You can lay in your bed outside of the will of God. A tree can fall on your house and a branch can come through and pierce you through in your bed thinking that you're safe. But I want you to know the safest place that you could ever be is in the will of God. And you need to just say, God, show me your will. Show me your will. Show me your will. And when doubts are all around me, I'm going to reach back to the things that I am confident about. Because the things that I'm confident about in your word, in your will, and what you've shown me in prophetic vision, in those things, God, I'm going to be confident. Confident. So when the world is filled with doubt and fear and trepidation, in this will I be confident. And then David said this, that one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to just commend you for being in the house of the Lord. I commend those who are even tuning in, connecting to the house of the Lord. There's a strength, there's a safety in his house. And sometimes we just need to know what God thinks. And those are some thoughts that just come from the Spirit of the Lord before we go into the Word of the Lord for today. I hope that that bless you. Sometimes... The appetizer blesses you just as much as the entree. Our text today comes from a familiar passage in Mark chapter 5, verse 25 through 29 in the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything that she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She'd heard about Jesus, and so she came up behind them through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she'd been healed of that, of her terrible condition. I'm talking today from the subject, driven by desperation. Driven by desperation. Driven by desperation. It is interesting to know... That there are some things that you won't do until you get desperate. And oftentimes, the real kind of prayer that God answers is a desperate prayer. When you, 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 you feel like you don't really have other options, it's like, God, I got to, you, you got to do something. Have you ever felt under such intense pressure that God, something has got to give? I can't go on living like this. This is too much. I can't do this but for so long. And that's when you begin to become desperate. God answers desperate prayer. And and let me say this. Whenever you get desperate about something, you're not thinking about other people's convenience. Jesus was on his way to deal with a, a little girl by the name of Tabitha who was sick unto death. She was at the point of death. She was on her deathbed. Jesus is on his way there to go to heal her. And in route to going to do a good thing, a woman interrupts him. It's a blessed interruption. Because he's on his way to go to raise a sick girl from a deathbed. And here he's interrupted by a woman with an issue of blood. And so we don't even know the woman's name. There are at least about 728 unnamed women in Scripture. It doesn't mean that they are insignificant. It means that he's pointing to the parable of what the text is illustrating that makes it relevant to us in this day and time. And so here she's one of these 728 unnamed women of Scripture, but she's vitally important. She's a woman with an issue of her blood. And most people in our world today, when you start thinking about some of your greatest problem, is with your blood. It's with your blood. Folks, it's blood related to you. <laughs> yeah, you got to read through the text. It's a woman with an issue of her, of her blood. People have problems with their mama, their daddy, their brother, their sister, their son, their daughter, their niece, their nephew, their cousin, their uncle, their aunt. How many people? have had an issue of their blood molested by a perverted uncle. An issue with their blood. An absentee father who was emotionally unavailable. A mother that had addictions and was narcissistic. An issue 
with that blood. Here she is, a woman. It doesn't matter her name. Put your name in there. See somebody pop up in your own life, but she's a woman with an issue of blood. We still have issues of blood. That it, it, This is a human issue. It's not even a male-female thing. This is a human issue. She's a woman with an issue of blood. And, and I want you to, uh, to, to just rehearse with me this desperate woman's journey. Let's just rehearse her, her journey. She suffered for 12 years. She spent all her money trying to get well. And in this a pain, she got worse. After she spent all her money trying to get well, because so much of our modern medicine is not designed for cure, but for treatment. You know why? Because there's no real profit when you cure them. The profit is in the treatment. So they want to keep you on treatment. If they cure them, then you stop the flow of the money. This woman had an issue of blood, had spent all of her money. The Bible says she spent everything on doctors. She got a bad end of the stick. She spent all of her money and didn't get any better. It would have been all right had she gotten better, but she did. She got worse. She got worse. Then the next thing, she heard of Jesus. She heard about Jesus. Then she followed him. She heard him. You, you can't follow somebody you've never heard of. She heard of him. Faith comes by. She heard about Jesus, and then she followed Jesus. And then she spoke her faith. She said, if I may but touch his clothes, I will be made whole. And then she touched his clothes. She acted on her faith. Faith is, is about action. And then she received an instant miracle. An instant miracle. An instant miracle. I know down in my shanana that we're about to enter once again into a season of instant miracles, suddenlies, where challenges and issues and frustrations that have taken days and weeks and months and sometimes years to resolve, suddenly there's going to be a break in it. Suddenly you're going to wake up one day and the attitude is going to be gone. Suddenly the pain, the issue, the breakout that has been recurring in your body, suddenly, all of a sudden, God will put an end to it and you'll know this was the divine hand of God. There's a difference between the hand of God and the finger of God. The finger of God comes in judgment. The hand of God comes in protection and blessing and favor. But we're coming into a season of suddenlies where God will quickly do a work of things that would take years and decades to try to work through and suddenly there'll be a breakthrough suddenly the property will sell suddenly the infection will clear up suddenly your dizzy spells will stop suddenly I don't know who I'm talking about this issue with your uh, digestive tract suddenly 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 your insomnia will see suddenly God, suddenly, we are entering into divine seasons of suddenly. You follow Jesus for a season. Nobody has to give you, except that it's coming at 8.30 on a Friday night. It'll just be suddenly. God will break in on you and surprise you with deliverance. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly your mind will snap back. Suddenly, your hormones will come into balance. Suddenly, suddenly, your sleep will be normalized suddenly suddenly your mental fog will clear and you'll be able to concentrate and focus suddenly things that you've been dealing with suddenly your stuttering will disappear suddenly 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 you'll wake up and it'll be gone suddenly the nightmares will cease i don't know about you but i feel the holy ghost in this place today god is up to something god is up to something god is up to something. She received instant miracles. The last thing, she felt healed. Her feeling was the last thing. She felt healed. That was the last thing that, that she felt in her body. She had faith. She spoke that faith. She acted on the faith. And the last thing that happened is that she felt in her body that her condition had been healed. She felt it. That was, so don't let your feelings lead you. The feelings follow. Signs and wonders follow. Follow. They follow the word. Now let me tell you this. 
It's one thing, you know, this lady had bled for 12 years. 12 is the number of order. It meant that her life was completely out of order. She's bleeding at the point of intimate relationships for 12 long years. It's normal to bleed after an accident or an injury. It's normal. It's normal to have issues with bleeding after surgery. After a woman oftentimes has a baby, bleeding is normal. Uh, the, the, the monthly menstrual cycle of bleeding for a few days each month is normal. For women that are in that stage of their life, that kind of bleeding is normal. But here this woman had bled every day, the Bible says, for 12 years. That's abnormal. Every day for 12 years. Can you imagine being on your cycle every day for 12 years? This is this woman's issue. For 12 years, every day. She had had no accident, she's still bleeding. She had no surgery, yet she's still bleeding. And it began to bleed her finances. And it began to bleed her faith. When things have been happening for a long time and you're waiting, wondering, Lord, are you, are you ever going to move? And it's taken a while. Bleeding out. Her finances were drained. Blood was bleeding from her body. Her faith was bleeding. Her options were bleak. And yet she pressed on. You know why? Because she was desperate. You can hurt so long, you can get desperate. You'll try anything when you're desperate. you do something that looks embarrassing when you're desperate. You don't try to be cute when you're desperate. When you're desperate, you'll try it. You'll drink stuff that tastes nasty when you're desperate. But when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind when she heard of him. She didn't care about other people and what they would think of her. I know that she was going through a mental uh, battle because with one hand, faith was saying, reach out and touch him. Doubt said, get your hand back. Faith was saying, if you just touch him, you get healed. Doubt was saying, you see other people touching and nothing is happening to them. She's going through a battle, but here's, here's the deal. When the internal pressure is stronger than the external pressure, you'll follow your internal compass over the external crowd. When, when your internal pressure, the internal pressure, is stronger than the external pressure, that's why you got to have something so strong on the inside. That then you'll, you'll follow your internal compass because of the internal pressure. That's the way that you overcome peer pressure. You get a, a greater pressure on the inside than the pressure that's on the outside, and it keeps you from imploding. And so this is what this woman did. She's desperate, and her desperation for healing is stronger than her fear of the opinions of people that are in the crowd that, that will see her. Here's the deal. Most people will not change until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. Most people will not change until the, the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's where she was. That's what made her desperate. She was driven by this desperation. My question to you is, what drives you? What drives you? She was driven by pain. She was driven by discomfort. She was driven by blood. She was driven by its frustration. She was driven by its longevity. What drives you? Everyone is driven by something. Everybody is driven by something. What drives you? What drives you? Listen, ladies. Don't try to see what a man drives. See what drives a man. Now this works the other way too. Men, don't, don't see what she's driving. See what drives her. Everybody is driven by something. Notice what James chapter 1 verse 14 says. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 
That word lust is an interesting word because the Greek word translated as lust here is the word epithumia. Epithumia. And it is bigger than just sexual lust. This is not just talking about being in sexual heat. It's bigger than that. It's epithumia. Uh, it's, it's bigger than just bodily appetites and the lasciviousness of, of the flesh. The Greek word epithumia is associated with the desire of the soul, which is the moving force of that which pertains to the body. What moves you in your soul? It's the moving force, the epithumia. What is the burning or the passion that is in your soul that's driving your behavior? There's an epithumia that drives people to kill somebody. That's an epithumia. It's a sickness. It's a drive in their soul. It's a drive in the soul. It's not just merely a lust of their flesh. It's a, a perverted desire in the soul. It's a burning. It's an inclination of the soul to enjoy something or to acquire something or to be recognized. And so this is so much deeper than just sexual attraction. It is about also ambition. What drives you? What is your, your real lust, your epithumia? This burning desire of your soul that is motivating your flesh. What is that drive of your soul? What motivates you? And I want you to think about this because this drive, it is about power. It's about power. Power is about influence. Uh, this drive is about money. Money is about materialism. So you can impress people with your Gucci and your Louis Vuitton and your, your diamonds and your bling blings and whatever. It's about money so you can buy materialism. It's about power. It's about money. This, 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 all of this epithemia, this, this drive that's on the inside of you, it, it's, it's about a desire for success. It's about popularity, which is about acceptance. And approval of other people. But may I just say this, that so many people have this epithumia, this drive in their soul, just trying to be successful so they can be something of importance in the world. And based on what you drive and the kind of house that you live in or the area that you live or, and all of that, and that becomes your symbols of success. It's amazing that oftentimes when people lack the real success on the inside, they try to overcompensate with external signs of success. May I say this to you? Success is not about uh, what you have achieved or accumulated. It's whether you feel good about who you have become. Because if you get the nice house, if you drive the ideal car, if you've got the wardrobe that you really want, but you don't like who you are when you look in the mirror, you really fail. My dad's motto was this, that no amount of success can compensate for failure at home. No amount of success can compensate for failure at home. Who wants to succeed in the eyes of people on TikTok and Instagram. Amen. But you really know that that's not who you are. Can you respect yourself when you lay down and put your head on your pillow at night? What do you really think about you instead of being concerned about what other people think about you? That's a huge difference between image and real character. And so success is not about what you've achieved or accumulated. It's whether at the end of the day, you really like yourself. Real success is measured by whether you are loved and respected by God, by yourself, by your family, and by your friends, those that are closest to you. That'll tell you who you are. If you can feel loved and respected by the individuals who are closest to you, that's the real measure of success. It's not about how much money that you've uh, left and what your financial portfolio looks like and how much cryptocurrency and all of this that you have. Because you can have all of that and if the people closest to you hate your guts. If you've got things of where you say, Lord, 
Have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not fed the hungry? Have I not done this and done that and done the other? And God says, depart from me. I don't like who you are. Keep your offering. I don't like who you are. I don't want anything from you, Cain. You're not real. Your heart is not right. The Bible says it was not that God rejected Cain's offering. The Bible says that God had not respect unto Cain. And when God can't respect you, you got a problem. If the folks that are closest to you can't respect you, that's a serious character indictment. And it means that there's been some deep failure along the way. And so we don't measure our success by the accumulations of things. But whether we are loved and respected by God, by self, by family, by friends, the people that are closest to you, what do they think of you? That's the real measure of your success. But here was this woman with an issue of her blood, folks close to her. And out of her desperation, she stuck in a crowd, stuck in the crowd of mediocrity with everybody else in the crowd. When you move with the crowd, you get no further than the crowd. Birds of a feather also they flock together, but they also fly to the same destination. And only this woman got what nobody else in the flock got. Because she did one thing that they didn't do. She busted a move. Your faith will cause you to bust a move. Look at somebody tell them, bust a move, bust a move. When you're driven by desperation, you will bust a move. You will bust a move. If you want to get out of your prison, bust a move. <laughs> I mean, you got to bust a move. You have to bust a move. If, something, if, if, if you're frustrated, if you're sick, bust a move. You got to bust a move. She said, if I, if I made but touch, I got to reach out and do something that nobody else who's in this crowd with me is willing to do. She had to bust a move and do something that nobody else was willing to do. It was within reach to the whole crowd. But she saw an opportunity that nobody else saw, and she took it. She busted a move. You know why? Because faith is an action word. It forces you to leave the comfort zone. Faith forces you to leave the comfort zone. And have you ever thought about the fact that the Lord rarely asks anybody to do anything that's, that's just easy? It may be simple, but it's not easy. And here... You know, when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure, he began to explain to them that he was going back to his father. In St. John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done and even greater works because I am going to be with the father. Jesus was explaining here that all of us who believe on him, anyone who believes, anyone who believes in me, he says, is going to do my works. That's why I'm telling you, it's time for us to be an answer and do the works of Jesus. It's time for us to be an answer and do the works of Jesus. And not only that, he didn't say that you'll do the works that I do. He says, and greater. I, think that that, I don't think that that means greater in significance. I think it means greater in number. Because there are more of us. There was only one Jesus, but... There are a lot of us. And so he says, and greater, 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 greater works because of the collective works that my whole body does in various places all over the world. They'll do the works of Jesus in whatever, whichever sphere of influence that they are. If you're an educator, do the works of Jesus there and ask God, Lord, give me a revelation of how to do your works. If you were a school teacher in a public school, how would you, how would you, how would you move? If you were a server in a restaurant, Lord, how would you how would you move? How would your hospitality flow out to people? If you worked in a hospital, how would you operate? If you worked in a factory, if you worked in retail, how would you move? Jesus explained that. And Jesus is saying to us, listen, the works that I do, you're going to do also. Now, let me say this. That's a tall order. It's daunting. And it's an intimidating task. 
It's unnerving. Has God ever given you something to do, put a vision in you, given you a dream, and you said, Lord, how am I supposed to do that? Where am I going to get the money? Who's going to help me to do that? Lord, I don't even know where it began. Has God ever given you something and you don't know where it began? And it feels like it's too big for you? And, and you start wondering, Lord, how shall this thing be? If you'll ever read his book, you'll discover that God will call you to do things that seem impossible to you. He tells a woman that doesn't have a husband, who's never known a man, you're going to have a baby without a man. The Holy Ghost is going to come over you. He told her something she had never heard of. She had no Bible for that. But you know what she did? She didn't argue with him. She said, be it unto me according to your word. She's the only one that broke out and had God's baby. He told a man with a withered hand, stretch forth your hand. The man is palsied. The hand is paralyzed. He's telling a man with a paralyzed hand to do the impossible. I'm telling you, he doesn't tell you to do stuff that's easy. It, it, it's, it may be simple, but it's not easy. He told a, a dead man to get up. <laughs> so please, don't expect God to give you an assignment that's going to be easy. It ought to intimidate you. But because the assignment intimidates us, guess what he did? He promised to us a comforter. A comforter, a paracletus. One called alongside to help us. A comforter, a helper. He says, I'm giving you a daunting task, but I'm not giving it for you to do it alone. The Holy Ghost works best when you're outside of the comfort zone. That's why he will put you sometimes in some of the most uncomfortable positions that you could ever imagine in your life. And I want you to see what Jesus was telling us about this comforter in St. John chapter 14, verse 14, uh, 16 through 18. Notice, he said, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Because Jesus was saying, I'm with you now, I'm comforting you. But when I'm gone, he's going to give you another comforter that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. And notice what he says. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. I'm not going to leave you without a helper. Without somebody to keep you from freaking out. But I'm going to call you to do something that's big, but I'm going to send a comforter that will give you a crazy kind of an assurance. In this will I be confident when the whole army was against him. In this, though a host should encamp against me, in this, you know why? He had a comforter. He had a comforter of the word. But let me give you a, let me give you a warning here. Beware of counterfeit comforters because they can keep you from your calling and from the Great Commission. Beware of counterfeit comforters. Beware of com counterfeit comforters because you'll become anxious, nervous about something, and the devil will offer you a counterfeit comforter. And we deal with counterfeit comforters. The Holy Ghost, Jesus said, listen, I want you to depend on me. Depend on the Holy Spirit whom I will send the comfort, the comforter. And almost for every gift that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. Can I tell you a few of the counterfeit comforters? Food is a con counterfeit comforter. You know, we have what it, co comfort foods because it makes us feel better, but it doesn't change anything. Food is a counterfeit comforter, and it won't always be with you when it's, when it's down, it's gone. <laughs> it's a counterfeit comforter. Uh, food, I mean, comfort, it still doesn't heal the depression, does it? You, you, you eat it, you, you feel good while it's going down, while you're eating ice cream, the banana split, whatever it is. The fried chicken, the macaroni and cheese. It is, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, God, you're in heaven. Your eyes are rolling back in the back of your head. It's so good. But it leaves. It's a counterfeit comforter. Drugs, counterfeit comforter. Excessive alcohol, counterfeit comforter. Because when it wears off, there you're back with the same situation. Sex, it is a counterfeit comforter. Counterfeit comforter. People get stressed and they start... Being driven, this epithumia drives them to this, this lust, this sexual kind of thing. Because it's comfort, it takes them away, it relaxes them. I had a young person that I accosted and I, I, said, I said, why do you smoke weed? He said, it relaxes me. 
And I said, with all due respects, I said, you know what? I said, here's the issue. You're using weed and putting the Holy Spirit out of a place to work in your life. That's his job. He's your comforter. He'll relax you. He'll help chill you out. Drugs is counterfeit comforter. Fake friends are a counterfeit comforter. Fake friends. Fake friends. You know why? Because fake friends will keep you from your calling. They'll keep you from the Great Commission. Fake friends. And then here's another thing that's a counterfeit comforter. Followers and fans on social media are counterfeit comforters. You post a picture and every time you get a like, it makes you feel... <laughs> and now you're trying to figure out what can I do to top that the next time. It's a counterfeit comforter. Because after you got that pose and put on this outfit and flip the hair this way and the lashes, bam. Now how do you top that? It's counterfeit comforter. Don't put the Holy Spirit out of a job in your life by using counterfeits. And you don't even recognize the counterfeit until you've had an experience with the genuine. You know, in World War II, one of the things that Germany did to try to impact the economy of, of England, they took several million dollars, printed several million dollars of counterfeit money and dropped them over the city to try to bankrupt the economy. They used counterfeits. But when you got real money, you learn how to identify the counterfeit. But if your first encounter with money was a counterfeit, you'd think that the genuine is the fake. Be careful of counterfeits. And let me say this to you, that what hinders and derails most people is a who, not a what. It's a who, not a what. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7 through 10. Notice this. You were running superbly. Who cut in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience? This detour doesn't come from the one who has called you into the race in the first place. And please don't toss this off as insignificant. It only takes a minute amount of yeast, you know, to permeate an entire loaf of bread. Deep down, the master has given me confidence that you will not defect. But the one who is upsetting you, whoever he is, will bear the divine judgment. Do you see that it's a who? He said, you were running superbly. And he says, who cut in on you? Who tangled your feet? Who is it? That kept you from following the true course. Who, not a what? Who? When the devil wants to mess up your life, he sends a counterfeit person into your life to try to derail your destiny. He always uses a counterfeit. And here is this woman with this issue of blood that for the first time she realizes that a real healer is there who is not after her money. And he has the real goods, not just trying to put her in treatment, but he brings a cure. And Jesus stopped the woman to ensure something on the inside of her in Mark chapter 5 and verse 30. He wanted this woman's faith to be directed, and he asked the question, who touched me? He's a prophet. He could have said, hey, I, I, know, I know it was you. He wanted the woman to own it. He didn't want her to touch and sneak off heal without his talking and telling her the source of that healing. Because she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. And she touched his clothes. Power went out of Jesus. And she felt in her body immediately that she was healed. And Jesus stops the woman. And he says to her, Woman, your faith has made you whole. I don't want you to think that it was a piece of fabric because you'll have people chasing my fabric and when I'm gone, 
There won't be any, any more fabric, but your faith can remain. So he wanted to point her faith to that which is eternal. He didn't want her faith to be misguided, to say, girl, I touched his clothes. And all I know, and can you imagine, I think that after this incident with this particular unnamed woman in scripture, the fame of this story spread around. And when Jesus began to go to other places, the Bible, then you'll find more and more instances of crowds thronging Jesus, pressing on him, trying to, but see, they were just touching in curiosity. She didn't touch in curiosity. She touched in faith. And she'd already spoken it and said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. She spoke her faith and Jesus wanted to identify that the power that healed you was not here. He said the same thing to the, uh, the woman in Luke chapter 7, verse 50. He located this woman's faith. This was the woman that was a sinful woman that came while Jesus was sitting at a house. And she came and, and washed his feet with her with her tears and she dried it with her hair and then she took out this expensive alabaster box and poured perfume that was equivalent to one year's wage on the feet of Jesus and Jesus wanted her to know listen this is not about hocus pocus and about worship at somebody's feet he said to this woman your faith has saved you your faith he identified her Faith. Whatever issue it is that you're dealing with, set your faith upon him. Get your eyes on Jesus. Off of what human systems can do. Stop looking to the government to do what Jesus really wants to do for you. Some trust in horses and chariots. But it'll always leave you empty. I don't know about you, but whether you have a Smith & Wesson or not, the name of Jesus is a weapon. If you've got him, even when you have spent all that you have on doctor, she had no more money, but I'm here to declare to you today, that the name of Jesus on your lips, on your tongue, is worth more than a credit card in your pocket. And if you'll just trust him, put your faith in him and speak your faith that if I may but touch him, that Jesus, I need an experience with you. Lord, I've got to have something by my, the longing that's in my soul. It's not for a sandwich, a bowl of soup and a cheese, grilled cheese. I've got to have something for my soul. When it's your soul that's weary, <laughs> a posturepedic mattress won't fix that. Jesus is saying that I want your epithumia, the deep burning desire of your soul to be me. And what happens? When people are not running to churches and tuning in to ministry broadcasts just to get content, but to get him, to have an experience with him where they touch, my God, power doesn't transfer until you touch. You got to have an experience with Jesus. It's not up here. It's that epithemia in your soul. Well, he sets your soul on fire. There's a longing, there's a burning that happens in your soul. Jesus came and their eyes were beholding when his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus. And when they finally figured out that it was Jesus who had been with them, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? The epithemia, they had a deep longing down in their soul their soul have you really craved him in your soul may I remind you that the Lord said that my house is not to be a house of great preaching 
nor a house of great revelation, not a house of great teaching, not a house of great music and worship and arts. But my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And let me just say this to you. Human works can never do what prayer can do. And prayer doesn't do what human works does. It's not an either or. It's a both and. It amazes me that when we have tragedies that happen in the world, that oftentimes you think if you had better security. But it's hard to secure yourself from a demon. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty they're not puny they're not pusillanimous they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and I'm telling you we got to deal with the demon spirits that's filling the minds of young people and old folks isolating them from the flock of God they're always on the periphery they're always feeling that I'm out here by myself. And you start seeing weird behavior. That's why we got to be praying because prayer makes you a discerner. You, certain things you got to know in the Holy Ghost. Something that's trying to get a hold of my child. We need praying mothers and praying grandparents. We need praying teachers. We need praying coaches. That when you see something going after the minds trying to grip them, something unnatural in the epithumia, in what's a, an ungodly desire in their soul. They need an experience with Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that we have to take authority in the name of Jesus and say, Satan, the blood is against you. I'm telling you, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. There are some things that are resident evil, deep wickedness, gross darkness, but he is the light. I don't know about you, but I'm not afraid. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength, the stronghold of my life. I will not be afraid. What can man do to you? already a dead man I died to myself a long time ago ha! it's time for there to be a deep longing in our souls for God when you become desperate for him desperate for him not for popular speakers not for popular singers desperate for him it's amazing that people will flock and fill places because of human beings. There's coming a hunger for God himself. There is a God-shaped void in every man and in every woman that only God can fill. You can't fill it with personality. You cannot fill it with drugs and alcohol and sensual pleasures. You can only be filled with God. You can only be filled with God. What I'm saying is not popular, but it is true. It's time for us to long and hunger after God with deep desperation. May we be di driven by desperations back on our knees. Back to a deep place of prayer. Certain things that you don't figure out by your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge and then he will direct. He's calling us. He's calling us. He's calling for a deep hunger in your soul. There's a longing that's there. Deep calls under deep. He calls us. There's a longing to come apart and commune with him. And there's a restoration. There's a calm and there's a peace that you can only get through prayer, through worshiping God, through focusing your thoughts and your attention upon him. Through remembering his commands because they are an anchoring point for our life. When you're in a storm and when you're in darkness. What is your epithemia? What is the thing that is in your soul that's driving your flesh? What drives you? May you be driven to the foot of the cross. 
May you be driven to prayer. May you be driven back to his word. May God drive us back to him. Whatever God uses to bring us back to him, thank him for it. No matter how unpleasant, no matter how difficult, thank him for it. Because he has not left us comfortless. He has given us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with us forever. You'll never wear out. You'll never worry him to death. You'll never become weary with you and say, keep your opinions to yourself. He's a comforter. That'll just say, be still, my child. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted among the nations. Be still and know that he is God. I want us to close today just by asking each of you right where you are to ask God to begin to feel even your desires. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And then he will put his desires in your heart. The epithemia, the desires of your very soul, will drive you, set it on fire as a passion that I know that I've got to do this. This is a part of my God call and my God destiny. And nothing else will satisfy. It's specific of what God has called you to do. Ask him to reignite you because some of your fire has gone out. And you need God once again. Our God who is a consuming fire. To light the fire of your soul once again. It was John Wesley. Who out in a wilderness place that was ostracized from the traditional church. That began to preach out in the highways and the byways of life. And crowds began to draw themselves to him and religious leaders came to him and asked him, why are the people following you? And he said, John Wesley sets himself on fire and people come to see him burn. People will always turn aside to see a burning man or a burning woman. What consumes you? Driven by desperation. Let's pray. Father, we desperately need you. Our world desperately needs you. We are not like those who have no hope. Ha! You are our hope. Our blessed hope. Our eternal hope. We set our faith upon you, Lord. And we say, God, if we can just touch that covering, that finished work, that which you have already called finished from the beginning. If we can touch it, God, we know that your power will flow into us and that you'll begin to heal our bodies. May you give us a season, season of divine suddenly, supernaturally, where you're moving in us, restoring us, healing us, delivering us. God, we trust you to do the work. I pray that you will search every heart. And everything that is not like you, burn it up. Pull it out of us. Cause it to shrivel up and die. Every thought of insecurity, inadequacy, doubt, fear. Lord, we put our faith in you today. We're driven back to the old rugged cross. We're driven back to the power of the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the power of prayer, the power of praise, the power of worship. God, may you once again reignite our souls, reignite us, God, reignite us in places where our lamp has gone now. God, we pray that you will anoint us with fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit, 
Fresh oil. Fresh oil. That is a source of the light. Fuel to the light that will burn. May you anoint us, God, with fresh oil today. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will reorder the desires in our souls today. In our minds, reorder what we crave. Reorder, Lord. Take every ungodly craving out of us. Fill us, God, with the desires that are birth of your spirit. God, do a work in us and then do a work through us. We pray, God, that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we pray that a season of miracles and the suddenness of God will fill us, fill us, fill us through and through. And may your name be exalted in all of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.